Welcome everybody to the uh, session, Eight Guiding Principles for Agile Coaches, Change Agents from Spotify Ads R&D Coaching Team. And we have today with us Jason Yip, who is a senior Agile coach from Spotify. Cool. And yeah, feel free to um, add uh, chat and Q&A while I'm talking. Um, uh, that'll help me get a sense of what people are thinking about. Um, so hello again, as mentioned, my name is Jason Yip. I'm a senior agile coach at Spotify. And today I'm going to talk about um, some guiding principles uh, that we came up with um, as a agile coaching team at uh, Spotify within the advertising R&D area. Um, so uh, a lot of these things came up uh, from the coaching team uh, in Spotify advertising R&D. Uh, and this is us uh, here in this picture. Um, and we came up with these eight principles, uh, which we thought were useful. Uh, they're derived from what has seemed to work for us um, and what hasn't um, over around five years uh, since uh, I've been there. And uh, I think most people were there. Some of them joined a little bit later. Um, but these are derived from our experiences there. Okay, so uh, another thing, I have adjusted the language uh, so that it's more general um, and added some more details to, to compensate for lack of shared context. The, how we actually express them internally is a little bit different, um, and that's just to reflect um, shared context. Like We already know uh, what we're talking about there, uh, but I've uh, tweaked this a bit just so that they're more general and maybe useful for a broader audience. Uh, this slide here uh, shows, it's kind of a copy and modification of something that we actually use internally. So it looks like this, uh, but again, as mentioned, I've changed uh, some of the language and some of the descriptions just so it's easier for you to understand. Uh, this is the full list of eight guiding principles. And what I will do is expand on each of them in turn. Um, I'll show this again at the end. So if you wanna take a screen cap or whatever, of it, um, you can do so. Um, also, the slides I assume will be shared. Okay, so let's start with the first principle. Um, the idea here is uh, you are more impactful with both team level and senior leadership relationships. Uh, what does that mean? So team level relationship, um, this just means uh, that you are engaging with individual teams and individuals um, in order to make sure that you have a more accurate view of what's actually going on. Uh, so there is a phenomena, I think, which is very common, where if you just talk to managers um, and uh, interpret what they think is going on, um, that usually will have a disconnect from what is actually happening. Um, this is not, uh, not necessarily uh, deliberate distortion from the managers. It's just that Sometimes they're just the power dynamics because the manager is part of a reporting line. So when someone uh, shares information, they're reluctant to do so to a manager. And I've, we have found uh, when you do have direct relationships and direct interactions with teams and individuals, you will get a different signal. Um, they'll say different things and the aggregate uh, diagnosis of what's happening uh, ends up being different. Um, the advantage of doing this is that uh, you start to be able to provide a useful insight to managers uh, because you provide this kind of third party view. Um, and then you'll be able to say, hey, here's something going on with relationships and what's actually happening, uh, which becomes useful uh, to the managers themselves, as well as you, you're acting from a coaching perspective, you're acting from uh, a correct assessment of what's going on. Now that's for the team level relationships. However, um, from the principle, the idea is that you want both this team level thing as well as senior leader relationships. Why do you want the senior leader relationships is because when you are dealing with uh, cross team systemic issues, uh, you typically need senior level relationships to have influence um, and the influence is necessary to change and address those things. Um, what doesn't really work is if you say you talk to the teams and you identify the problem. Um, and these are, let's say, if they're the broader problems, they're not problems that they can change on their own. And you don't have the influence uh, to do anything about it because you have no senior level relationships and you're not really useful to that team. All they can do is complain to you and all you can do is complain with them. 
Um, so that's the idea is that you want the team level relationships so that you know what's going on, but you want the senior level relationships so that you can do something about it. Okay, the next principle is you should not become operational. Um, I kind of summarize this as like in terms of a, what the coach or change agent should be doing or thinking about things is you want to enable others and then you want to move on to the next problem. So you don't want to be trapped on any specific problem. Now, this is not saying that you don't want to be hands-on. I think it is sometimes uh, useful, sometimes even the best way uh, to set up a role model systems and habits yourself so more directly um, because let's say if uh, a team or an individual doesn't know how to do something, having them try to generate that and derive it from scratch is unrealistic and unreasonable. Um, and it's easier just to role model it, show them uh, directly how to do it. Um, the, the, let's say the boundary line is when you become operational and responsible for that system and have it. So, um, hey, I'm going to show you how to do a thing, uh, but I'm not going to take responsibility for doing it ongoing. Um, so you're teaching versus um, becoming responsible. If you become responsible, operationally responsible for something, um, you like the issue here is that you become, um, you take away their ability to take responsibility. So you, you interfere with their development. Um, and the other thing is that you limit your impact. So if there are usually a whole bunch of problems, but because you become operationally responsible for one problem, um, you lose the ability to spend time on other problems. Okay, the next principle is too much time spent on quick win limits your ability to have sustained impact. Uh, quick wins, I think, are very useful because they help build momentum. And if you have momentum, it helps create influence. And if you have influence, you can initiate further improvements that are more difficult. Um, however, um, with a sort of complicated, complex system, not every improvement you're looking at is quick, especially when you're dealing with the systemic underlying systemic issues I mentioned before. Um, so if you spend all your time just dealing with quick win momentum building things, um, you're not spending enough time dealing with the underlying systemic issues. Like the, it's always useful to remember why are you engaging in the quick wind? It's not really for the result. It is to be able to buy time and influence to be able to deal with the underlying things. So you should spend that time there. Uh, the next principle is around uh, coach collaborations more effective than silos. Uh, it's kind of a phenomena um, and this can vary depending on where you're at, but I do find that uh, many agile coaches in our industry are very used to working alone um, just because of the dynamics. Um, maybe some places don't hire enough coaches or whatever. Um, so then because they're used to working alone, uh, they become unused to working in a team. And I think with um, even with coaching, teamwork is effective. Um, and it's useful to remind yourself, remember to do that, that if you have other people that can help, you should use that work as a team, not just as an individual. Um, and even if you don't have other coaches, if you're like a solo coach in an area, a solo change agent, it's worth still trying to team up by finding other allies. So it's kind of a weird thing to think that, um, hey, you're an agile coach, but even then it's easy to forget that teams are effective. Um, so it's a useful reminder to have. Um, I'm kind of there, this is a, somewhat of a repetition, but just a re-emphasis of this idea that results are for the short-term and systems and habits are for the long-term. Um, and this, this diagram is similar, but just to emphasize that point again, uh, we're doing these kind of quick win things or activities that are dealing with results, and that is to contain an issue. So if there's an active problem and you just need to get it under control, um, that's what results are for. Um, so you may be coaching to get a particular result in order to contain a problem so that um, you're buying space and time. Um, but there's really no real future in just doing those results-oriented things. If you want long-term systemic improvement, you have to deal with underlying issues. If you want to deal with underlying issues, you have to improve systems and habits. That, that's the only way to do it. And again, as mentioned before, that those things might take a little bit more time. Um, and this is not to say you just do one or the other, you have to do both. So results to contain and systems and habits to deal with long-term issues. Uh, the next principle is around involving existing leaders, formal and informal for brainstorming and implementation. 
Um, why would you want to do that? Um, it is because existing leaders have influence and power. So the reason why they are an existing leader, um, again, I've said both informal and informal because you could have people that are just influential, but they don't necessarily have a title. Um, it's because they have already worked out how to acquire influence and power. It doesn't matter how, they just have it. And as a change agent, as a coach, it's useful to utilize that influence and power. Um, um, it's much faster than trying to develop it yourself. And it's um, essentially counterproductive to compete against that. Uh, so the reason why you want to involve them is uh, you can now uh, leverage that um, and avoid getting into a conflict uh, with uh, existing influence and power, which depending on how long you've been there and how, how good you are, like it's just not necessary in any case uh, to compete. So um, always worth win in any particular situation to assess what exists in terms of influence and power and then uh, use that to um, the advantage of moving things forward. Okay, uh, the next principle is around uh, coaching structure, um, coaching strategy and coaching strategy and product business strategy. So the idea is that uh, the structure should follow the strategy even for coaching and the coaching strategy should follow the product business strategy. Um, so uh, kind of have questions here to clarify this. So um, this a general idea of structure should follow strategy applies to all teams, I'd say, in all organizations, um, which is why uh, coaching organization design should be the same. A product strategy is really about what are the most important product priorities to address. And this is the first thing you should understand. Uh, coaching existing within that context is what are the most important ways of working um, problems to address, and that should fall underneath the umbrella. What are the most important ways of working problems within the context of what are the most important product problems, um, which makes sure that what you're looking at is relevant uh, to the product context. And given, once you understand what are the most important ways of working problems to address, you should be looking at what are the best ways to organize to address those most important problems. And that's when you look at structure. Um, so you shouldn't be looking at coaching team structure, how you want to be organized until you understand the previous things. Now, this is an iterative process as is most things, but as a general driving direction, uh, this is what um, we would um, advocate for. And this makes sure that you don't do things that are irrelevant uh, to your particular business context. Okay, the next principle here is around uh, sharing your work and that it should be intentional, not just organic. I think it's very easy for people to think um, that um, you're just doing the work and it's enough. Um, but if you want to have influence to initiate larger changes, again, back to this idea of uh, some underlying systemic issues, uh, underlying systemic issues are important to have the larger scale change and those are, can be more difficult. Um, you require the influence to be able to initiate those larger systemic changes, which means that you need to be able to market your impact, your results in order to acquire influence. Um, so this idea that, hey, if I just improve things, people will notice is unlikely to be true. Uh, not Again, not because people uh, would be deliberately trying to ignore you. It's just that there are a lot of things happening and you want to be reliable about creating that visibility because you need influence to be able to create the larger uh, changes. Okay, uh, I'm just going to, so this is the summary of these uh, principles again, uh, but I've noticed I have a lot of questions. So let's maybe switch and start looking at those. Um, thank you, Jason. Uh, I'll be asking you the questions. Do you want to like uh, share the screen or we can? Uh, I. Uh, we can keep the screen. I can leave these guiding principles up um, just sure. so people can reference them. Yeah. So the first question uh, is from an anonymous attendee. Why only eight principles? Are there any more key principles that were left out or these eight principles were the key principles and more could not be identified or are not there in consideration? So I think he's asking that right. were there any more principles? Uh, th there's, there's probably more stuff that like in terms of what we came up with, um, this is what we just came up with. Um, I'm trying to remember whether we filtered this out. I think it just sort of fell to this many. There was some idea though of, 
there can't be too many because it's too many to remember, um, even to present. Uh, like partly why we even express this is a marketing exercise too, to say, hey, how do the coaches operate? What do they think through? And you don't want too many because um, it's uh, just beyond working memory. So a combination of working memory marketing, um, we did limit to around eight. Um, and I'm trying to remember if there were more, I think, I'm pretty sure we did talk about more things, but I, I wouldn't necessarily say, Hey, um, what else should I try to remember? Uh, because you're not going to, um, so like I'm relatively comfortable saying, Hey, these are, are ones that, um, I would emphasize and uh, like, Hey, if you get beyond all this stuff, then yeah, sure. Like we can talk about other things too. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is uh, by implementing these eight principles, were there significant improvements in the outcomes delivered by the agile coaches? Is it quantifiable just to know from the improvement purpose? Oh, that's interesting. Um, it's hard. Like we didn't necessarily say, Hey, um, cause we didn't really have that context of hey, we're not following any of these principles and I'm going to baseline and then I'm going to follow the principles and then what's the new thing? So we didn't do anything like that. So I can say, hey, um, this is quantifiably better. Um, it could be something you could try, but it, it's kind of a weird uh, thing to set up uh, because you effectively say, I'm going to ignore all this and just be bad and then <laughs> I'll see if it's better. Um, there are some things, like it's just more logical sense. There's some aspect of, it helps people understand how we operate. Um, and then uh, you, you could say there are some things where um, it's almost quite, it's at a qualitative level, quite obvious. Like you'd say, hey, we're doing this thing um, and people don't care because it's too shallow or it's a light thing. You're not dealing with the underlying problem. So it's some of those things are obvious, but yeah, there's nothing like um, we baselined with not following any of this and then followed off. So I couldn't say that that was measured in that way. All right. Um, the next question we have from Chit Chitrantana. Um, are there any skills or natural reactions that coaches have to unlearn to coach better? Some of that is uh, might be individual specific. So um, I'm trying to think like I mentioned a few of these. What, one, I think, which I sometimes see. Oh, yeah, I mentioned a few, actually. So the one where. Um, depending on what your coaching background history is, you may be used to just being uh, working on your own. So you're very independent, um, just used to having to work things out and not necessarily having to coordinate with a team. Um, so at least within a coaching team, I think that's a habit you would want to break. So to say, okay, no, I have um, other people helping out and I want to engage them and involve not just in like, oh, I'm going to engage them so I get buy-in, but I'm going to engage them to try to work out what to do and all that kind of stuff. And I would say, even when you don't have other coaches, that's a habit you should try to be developing. So involve other people, other allies, both for the exploiting or leveraging their influence, but also because you're more effective um, as a team. Um, the other thing is, I think, um, I mentioned before of, getting into something that you're getting to operational. And this is a balance point. Like I think sometimes people are too hands-off when they should probably step in because they need to demonstrate and they're leaving things too much up to people trying to work it out from scratch, but at the same time, not getting pulled into where you're essentially doing things for other people. Um, and so it does depend on what your background is and what you've been doing in the past. And you kind of have to judge that, but those are the ones I see a lot. Yeah. Um, we are actually running out of time with that. Uh, thank you, Jason. Thank you so much for your time and the session.